Uh, we're joined now by TJ the Power Donny, the former IBF Super Bantamweight Champion. First of all, I guess, TJ, how are things in Australia at the moment? I guess no more so than here. COVID-19 has hit pretty hard over there as well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty much the same. We're not on a total lockdown now, but it's only a matter of time before it happens, you know, because as much as people are being told to, um, you know, follow the rules, everybody thinks it's not as, as serious as it is. And before you know it, we're all going to be stuck in our homes and we'd be lucky if we were let out to, to get a week shopping, you know. Yeah. You're over in Perth now at this stage, TJ. I am. I'm. I'm going. I'm kind of um, more permanently in Perth now. Reason being is it's it's an. I've got a small family now, and it's an easier cost of living. And um, you know, uh, I'm another plus as well is my uh, my fiance Rebecca. Her parents have been living here for the past ten years, so she's got that little support network which helps us every time. You know, when I got to go away for training camps, like I got to go to America for eight to ten weeks at a time. You know, and it's mm. it's not easy with a. A little uh, crazy three-year-old running around the house and not having that little support network there to help give her give her a little dig out as well, you know. Everything, I guess, kind of changed very, very quickly as well. Like, it's not too long ago you were in Dubai and then you were travelling back to Australia and this kind of COVID-19 outbreak seemed to happen pretty much at that time. Yeah, it, that's exa- it was exactly around the time. Because I remember um, a couple of friends that travelled with me and uh, they were all covered up with gloves and masks and I was... Mr. Mr. Macho, you know, laughing it off, thinking, you know, it's not that serious at all at the time. And uh, by the time I got back then, it was crazy how, how many cases were after happening. And now, luckily enough, Australia hasn't been hit too bad yet. I think they've only had like um, 1%, 1% of their of their cases have been positive so far. But uh, when I got back, I developed uh, cold and flu symptoms and I ended, I ended up having to go and do a test myself which came back ne- negative, but I've been following the rules sin- since and um, self-isolating. And uh, luckily enough, I've got my own um, I've got my own gym set up at the house as well here, so uh, I don't have to travel too far to train, so I'm quite lucky that way. I was looking at Carl Frampton was talking last week because he was hoping to have a world title fight in Belfast coming up in June. That looks like it's going to be off now just because of the situation, but he was saying like that, he's got a gym in at home, he's trying to do as much as he can, but really, with social isolation, it's difficult to get any kind of sparring or real work in the boxing ring right now. Yeah, and that's that's the key, especially like as car as myself and Car get older, we kind of you know you ha- you can't be just murdering yourself on a treadmill and doing crazy weights. And you know when you when you get past your thirties, you gotta you gotta train smart. You know you gotta because you gotta keep the miles on the clock. So um, most of the work is done in sparring. Most of the condition is done in sparring, and you just top up with the treadmill and the weights and stuff. But um, yeah, that's one thing that that we we, uh, we will lose out on is the is the close contact sparring. Even even if it was light sparring, like we we can, just cannot be done, you know. So it's um it's unfortunate. But what can we do at this stage? Only um soldier on and follow the rules, and hopefully this all blows over sooner than we think it will. I'm not trying to age you in any way, but you are going to be 34 in November of this year. Do you start uh-huh. to kind of do you start to kind of think about the amount of fights you've got left? Does it put any pressure on you when you, I suppose, realise you're not a young man anymore? Yeah, um, look, uh, you, you you try you try. I, I was lying to myself for for a long time. You know, you know, you think like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not. But the more the more I look back on my performances and stuff, and I used to be a lot. I used to be um, a lot more reliant on my legs. Where now I'm kind of like I don't really use my feet as much, you know, because I, I, maybe they're slowing down a little, and I'm kind of more of a pressure fighter now. So you kind of you kind of just have to adapt to the way your body is aging, you know. So I don't I don't dance around the ring the way I used to, and just uh, stick and move. I'm more of a kind of a defensive defensive uh, pressure fighter now, which which is kind of suiting me. I'm I'm enjoying it, but um, yeah. You you don't notice, you know, yeah, you, like you're, that you are. You can't lie to yourself. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta adapt to the um, the way you're aging. And um, I feel like I feel like I'm developing into a into a nice tidy fighter that's gonna suit suit the way my body's aging. So it's not it's not too much of a problem. In terms of you were very hard on yourself um, after the Baluda fight a couple of Fridays ago. People probably saw the interview that you did with um, MTK afterwards, and you were very harsh in your own performance. I mean, you called it a nightmare night. Obviously, you were very disappointed with how things went. Ah, uh, um, that was that was straight after. It was because see, I was on I was on such a high because I'd be I'd been sitting in like the mandatory position. I was sitting in. I was sitting in a box seat for eliminators, everything with all the top 
boxing uh, governing bodies around the world. And then all of a sudden, um, I'm, I, or I'm, I'm in Dubai. I do a, I do an interview the morning of the fight. I'm talking about instead of like keeping my eye on the ball. I'm talking about Ahmed Aliyev. I'm talking about Danny Roman. All these big fights, mm. potential big fights. What was what were being talk, spoken about and were going to be happening towards the end of the year. And um, I don't know. I think I don't did it take my eye off the ball a little. I'm, I'm going through. I'm still going through so many different scenarios trying to trying to level with myself to make myself feel better about what actually happened on the night because like no disrespect to the guy um, Baluda yes okay he beat me I have to take the loss on the chin but and it, this, this, this is going to sound disrespectful but a fighter like that sh- shouldn't even be giving me, a, giving me a problem it was just a freak night it was just um, I think I got what, what I'm kind of blaming it on is I'm a 12 round fighter Mm. I was getting going after four rounds and he was like blowing hard. You'd have to be watching it live. To, you'd have to be ringside to see how much he was going. And that's why you couldn't see the urgency in me. Because I felt, I felt like, number one, I felt like I was bossing the rounds and I was scoring the harder punches. But obviously, when you look back in the scorecards, the judges weren't looking for that. They were just looking for the lad that was peppering and running kind of like that amateur style. Mm. but um, where I was just I'm just so used to get, getting marked and scored from being in America for being bossing the ring controlling the round sorry for rambling on but um, you know just I, I just felt like I was bossing the round that's why you, you couldn't see any urgency in me in the fight because I felt like I was in control of the fight I was winning the fight and especially then when it, when it took so long for the scorecards to be read out I was like oh my god this is going to yeah. be a draw but then when I heard them being called uh, the scores were so wide apart. I, that's when I raised my hand. I said, "It's definitely mine," you know. And then his hand was raised, and I was, I was just absolutely devastated. And yeah, back to um, just the interview with MPK, and that's why I was so devastated the next morning because um, that was like that was kind of a keep busy fight, um, just to keep 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 the numbers up. I hadn't fought in six months, and then we were going to move on to bigger things. But it's kind of a little setback now. Um, MTK have promised me that. It's not going to cause any any differences. They they still have a, a plan in place for me, and that um, I just got to keep working and keep just stay in the gym, and everything's going to fall into place. We're still going to have a big fight towards the end of the year, so I just got to keep my fingers crossed because uh, you just never know professional boxing. It's probably one of the most unpredictable sports out there, you know. Mm. What was the decision and the thinking around eight rounds? Was it just purely because you thought? I'm going to go, I'm just going to tune up, I don't probably need 12 rounds here. What was the thinking? So that's that's my thinking on it. But uh, anybody will tell you that trains with me. I am, I am one of the hardest workers, not only in, in the gym, in the sport of boxing. I really put, I put my heart and soul into it. And um, because, you know, you know the, old, the old cliche, you only get out what you put in. So I'm always grinding, but... Um, I, I could have did it 12 rounds, could have did 10 rounds, and I didn't know what the thought process was around my last fight in October being an eight rounder. Mm. And I was only, I asked afterwards, and they were like, look, it was a stacked card, and it wasn't really a high profile fight because of the level of your opponent and, and blah, blah, blah. So I was thinking maybe maybe that's what, what that's what the thought process was around, around um, the fight in Dubai. Was was eight rounds, but just looking back in hindsight, when the the stylistic matchup um, against a guy that hits and runs, you need more rounds against a guy like that because you need more time to break him down. Mm-hmm. Where if I had to have like a brawler, a guy who's going to stand in front of me, I've got serious power. Like I'm probably one of the hardest punchers in the division. Um, I reckon I reckon I could have I could have got him out there early. But when you have a guy that's just like hitting and running, and you can't really. Tr- trapping down to score four or five big power shots at a time it's hard to break a lad like that down so he was kind of stealing the round well obviously he was stealing the rounds in the judges eyes but not not in my eyes but um yeah so i think i just i needed um i needed maybe 10 12 rounds to go but i don't know what the thought process behind the eight rounder was i really don't but um it's uh, easy to say a lot of things in hindsight yeah, like nearly eight years now as a professional, you've only had two defeats in that period. How do you take defeats? Um, um, absolutely horribly. I'm one of the most competitive people you'll ever meet. Like even even when I'm playing games here, my son, I have to win. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm always cheating and joking around with him. You know, but um, 
no on a on a more serious note though no I take I take them bad like I was, I was just talking about that Danny Roman lost in an interview before the fight too and it's, I still haven't gotten over it and I was speaking about that I will not get over it until I have my opportunity to avenge the loss because yeah. it was the only loss in my career and then I had what I can only call a slip up a bad night um, a freak loss um, it, you know it's just a, what it's not like I was beaten by the bear opponent or I got a massive knockout or anything like that it was just it was just one of just one of those nights it just didn't happen for me and um, you know we're just going to have to try and um, get, just get back on the horse now and um, rectify it as quick as possible it's Hopefully. a re- really exciting division at the moment as well TJ at Super Bantamweight I mean Danny Roman takes all the belts he goes then gets defeated by Ahmed Aliyev and then potentially you're in the mix up with those two guys at the moment as well you legitimately have three guys who potentially can beat each other on their nights it's a very yeah. interesting division isn't it? Yeah it's 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 fantastic and it's, it's a fantastic situation because it's the politics and boxing sometimes you might be some of these fighters might be on different TV networks and with different promoters and fights are harder to make we all fight under the matchroom and the zone umbrella. So these fights are easy to make. All is a, ma- all is a matter of, of a phone call, you know. Mm. And um, it, it, each fight is appetizing. you got, because we're, we've all, stylistically, we're, we're kind of all got the same style. And it's very fan-friendly. So it's great for TV. So that's how easy they are to make, you know. But um, it's just going to be a bit of a waiting game now for a minute. Um, I know um, Danny Roman is he's back in training as well, and you know he's probably going to be trying to push for his rematch, and I'm going to be still trying to push for a big fight as well. So hopefully, hopefully I can get something big, something exciting, and get back out there and show that I'm far from done, and I'm a lot better than I was in Dubai. Yeah. Even though I feel like, even though I feel like I should have got the nod. Uh, it was a very, it was a very poor performance. I should have I should have been winning by a country mile, you know that way. So um, yeah, hopefully um we can we can get 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 a big win and get back in the mix with Roman and Mac Ak- Medaliev and be mentioned in those circles again. I suppose it's a very uncertain time at the moment, TJ, as well. You know, I know you're talking about fights later on in the year, but just for boxing in a general sense, I guess, would world travel slow down at the moment? We mentioned training is difficult for people with social isolation and so on as well. Probably a very uncertain summer for boxing coming ahead. This has to be a, a tricky enough time for fighters, I would think. Yeah, it's, I, 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 kind of, I kind of feel bad for them because um, I'm, I'm lucky enough, you know, I'm blessed, I'm a sponsored athlete, you know, so um, you know, I've, got, I've got a wage coming in whether I fight or not. But um, there's a lot of fighters out there fighting from paycheck to paycheck. So when they fight, like they've got to squander every penny they've got until their next fight. Plus, you you're thinking about like the cost of training camp fees and all that stuff for them. And a lot of guys were like probably after spending, God only knows, up, upwards of ten thousand on training camp fees for sparring partners, travel, blah blah blah. Because a lot of guys, especially the Irish guys, have to travel to England for mm. for the good work. But um. Yeah, to answer your question, is I am. It's it's really it's really bad for them, and um, I just I, the sooner the better. It blows over the amount of shows are after being called off, and I just I know I've been in that position on the way up. I know how hard it is when you're rely when you're relying on that paycheck um, to survive to the next paycheck, and then as soon as this, your shows are cancelled, it's um, you know you kind of you're left in limbo. You you kind of don't know what to do. 12 years now this said you've been living in Australia you know over on the east coast for quite a while now over um, since you've moved uh, I think in December permanently across to Perth as well um, when you first arrived in Oz did you ever think you were going to be there for more than a decade did you? No nobody gave me six months because <laughs> I was a real I was a real little townie you know I was always around Port Leash I was just I was seen everywhere I knew everyone I was known by everybody that's probably why I get so much so much support from back home because I was kind of the without sounding like the guy who I was I was quite popular like you yeah, know yeah. and um, everybody was like you'll be back here in three months don't worry about that you know and I was like yeah and that kind of I think that gave me the little push to, to last the year at least but um, when the year passed and um, when I got, got settled there and I was working I was I was making a few quid so I was like you know that's not a bad life and I went I went home I get I, and I did I went back home for about six weeks just to give it a test to see that that um what would I prefer and I said no I go back to Australia it's just a lifestyle and you know I'm being so close to the beach everything's laid back and I was assured of work every week at the time the recession had kicked in as well so there was mm-hmm. nothing back home and any any time I went back it was like everybody was down the dumps and everyone was struggling and it was hard for me to watch my family even struggle you know 
but at least for myself, um, uh, Australia, I kind of made home for for me. And um, the longer you're here, I, the more. I think the more difficult it is to decide to go back home, you know. And to this day, I still, I still really struggle with homesickness. I really do. Like my fiance Rebecca, she's like, I don't know, I don't know how you you are, because I'm there. I could move, I could move home in the morning. They just say to her, you know. Yeah. Because uh, we we've just got our own place, but it was a it was a it was a long long process and decision on where we were going to settle, because uh, because of wanting to go back to Ireland, but. Um, Jeez, we're five minutes down the road from um, from the beach. You know, we've got, we've got a great little uh, pre-kindy for Theo here in the school and the medical, everything is unbelievable in this country. So um, it's kind of it's kind of a good lifestyle here. So I can't I can't fault it. Yeah, hard decision, particularly if you're in your early 20s to try and pick between Bondi Beach and going back to Knockmay at that point. But uh, when you do go back to Port Leash, I mean, you seem to, to really enjoy it. I know you were back there for your training camp before the Danny Romain fight and you did a bit of coaching around the club and stuff as well. And I'd imagine yeah. particularly it must have been absolutely surreal after you won the world title to get the open car drive down the town and back around to the Civic Access. <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, it was fantastic. And um, to be honest, I couldn't believe it. And I, I was like... You know, I, I I was like, I even said it to Becca, I was like, yeah, maybe we we'll probably have 20, 30 people following us up the town. But as soon as we left, we left the church and headed up the main street. And we just as we were driving, it just started gathering momentum. And by the time we got to, say, the courthouse on Main Street in Portlaoise, and you look back down, you could not see the street. It was like just black with people. And, um, you know, I just, I was just, a, it was a surreal feeling, you know, to even... Even to know that people, um, you know, acknowledged and accepted what I what I'd done because I um, think I'm I was only the twenty first Irishman to ever, ever win a world a world a world title championship, and I'm the only the second person to go to Japanese soil apart from Wayne McCullough. Mm. You know, so that that is another bit of history, and um, it was just great to see people that actually um, acknowledged it and came out to support me and. Um, Hats off to uh, Pat Ryan, my old amateur coach, and Geraldine Reddy and and um, her husband for um, setting the whole thing up. You know, it was just it was just fantastic, and um, I can't thank them enough. Do you keep a fairly close relationship with Pat? Because God, for the last ten years or so, when you were kind of doing the journey fights between, say, the Philippines and Boston, and uh, fights in Australia, Pat kept on telling me he's like, keep an eye on Donny. He's going well. Have you maintained a close relationship with him all the time you've been gone? Yeah. Um, so Pat's Pat's my second daddy. You know, he's um, I've got I've, I've got a great relationship with him. He's got he's got a great relationship with all his past fighters. To be honest, like you know, um, I just recently there I, I brought a corner man with me actually, David Brown. So he he was a, he's an ex fighter of Pat's as well, and mm. the two of us get on with Pat like house on fire. But yeah, no, I always I always keep in touch with Pat. And um, I'll give him, I'll give him a phone call on fight week, and uh, you know, get Pat's, get Pat's a little bit of insight because, um, as much as it kills me to say it, sometimes Pat's always right, and it's <laughs> never until a, uh, sometimes afterwards you're like, Jesus, you should listen to Pat, you know. He's there's a, there's a couple of times he said to me, and even in the Roman camp, you know, he said there was a couple of things you should be tweaking here, and I, I felt like I was doing the right thing, and. You know, just you know when you're when you're your own man and you you're trying you trying to make your own decisions. But it's only in hindsight then I was like I I did call Pat and I put my hand up and said yeah we could have tweaked a couple of things there. Mm. But um that's the relationship we have. He he's kind of like he'll call me up and he'll have that father son relationship with me and that's the way he treats me. You know, because I know and I know I know he's very he's very uh, emotionally attached to me because of you know we've been through a lot up through the years. You know, and um, we'll always have that connection no matter how far away I am. He keeps working away with national champions and guys who potentially can go a long way as well. I think the club are very hopeful. I don't know when the Olympics are going to happen. It could be next year by the time we finish this chat. But they are hopeful that Michael Nevin might get there to the Olympics probably next year now at this stage as well. Yeah, I tell you, Michael's one of my um, Michael's one of my um, my number one bets for the uh, to to qualify and and medal. I see the way that kid can fight, and I see the way the kid spars. But it just goes to show back. Or this goes back to Pat. Now, it just goes to show the caliber of of a coach Pat Ryan is. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't just churn up some some kid with with a phenomenal talent that's won something. He's producing Olympians. He's produced a world champion in myself. He's producing All Ireland champions year in year out for a, for a, as long as you can remember. You know, I can't even put a amount of years on it. And it, that 
that will just tell you the caliber of a coach that has. He, and he's not just he's not just a boxing coach. He's a, he's all about development, and he's very he's very 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 good at man management. And uh, have to commend Pat on that because he's probably he's probably shaped me into the man I am today. You know, and, and just just with being respectful and being mannerly, and you know, just all just little things. He'd always be in your ear, just little small things that would always come back to you about what Pat would say. But yeah, he doesn't get enough credit for what he does in that town. And um, the man's still going, and he's building a, a high performance facility in, in Port Leash at the moment, which is almost finished. It's going to have like dormitories and everything for sparring partners to fly in and sleep there, so you don't have to be paying for hotel expenses and. The man, the man is just doing great things, you know, and uh, Polish Boxing Club is very, very lucky to have him. Yeah, your own Olympic dream, I guess, was ended by John Genevin. Uh, you lost that, ah. that, uh, that box off with him in 2007 going into 2008. Uh, he didn't go on to have a bad amateur career in the end and win world champion, world medals, European medals and an Olympic silver medal as well. Um, I suppose like, he would love to have gone to Beijing, but that was a difficult weight division to be in along with Nevin at the time. Yeah, um, well, I was the favourite going in there because Nevin was was only the youth coming up, you know. And I was the I was the the hot guy in the division. I was the the um, seasoned senior, you could say. Mm. And um, but uh, Nevin was on fire that time in the championships. I remember, and uh, he just had he just has the 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 most perfect style for amateur boxing. Probably one of the best amateur boxers Ireland's ever had. Yeah. He just had that lovely that lovely just punch and move, and he just had he has phenomenal skills. And we're just talking about losses earlier. It's probably another loss I've never got over, you know, because that killed my Olympic dream. And that helped me make my decision to take a year out and come to Australia. But, um, yeah, no, John Joe, he's had, he's had a fantastic amateur career. I would have liked to see him to uh, progress into the pros a little bit better, but he's had to be on and off so much. And I know... I know a lot, a lot about like your personal life can take a massive toll on your career, and he he just hasn't had the he just hasn't had the, the bounce of the ball that some of us might have had between management, between his own personal life, and just the way boxing went for him. I would, I would like to see him do a lot more because he deserved it. It was a hell of an Irish team at the time, though. I was looking at um, a draw sheet from two thousand and seven, a few days ago, that the IABA put up. You had Carl Frampton in and around the Irish team at the time. You Tyson Fury there for a while as well. Um, not a bad little kind of group of Irish boxers that were there around all seven and 08. Yeah, um, I, th- I think to 2006 to 2008, like, um, and we're all the kind of that that um, that team. They're all trying. They're all starting to come to. They were all starting to come to fruition in the past five six years in the in the pro ranks, you know, hmm. and. Um, and myself, I was probably the last person you would have think would have been would have been coming through because I was running around Bondi, you know, acting Jack the Lad, taking my time out boxing, and I was enjoying myself a little bit too much. But it was only when I seen Carl and the likes of the boys who I was on, say Jamie Conlin is another one, and boys who I was on the Irish team with, and I'm like, I oh, was mixing it up with these guys. And I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna give this pro game a crack, just thinking mm. like it's oh you just turn pro and that's it, but. It's a hard slog, like you know. I didn't get signed by no promoters. I was running around trying to sell tickets and trying just trying to make up enough money to put the fights on. I wasn't getting paid anything at the start. It was costing me money. Like I was just I was just getting up enough money to fly in an opponent and pay his visa fees, pay his purse, and little things like that, you know. But once I was in, I was in, and I'm a pro now, so I was like, I can't go back on it. So I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. As long as I got my world ranking, that really, then I just. I said, "Oh, I'm I'm going to make something of this." And um, a couple of years later, then we got into a, a good position, and we flew to Thailand. We won the eliminator, and yeah. six months later, I became world champ. Does that change your entire world as well? Because you say, like, it was difficult. You're not getting a promoter when you're starting out. The offers obviously come flying in. I'm guessing in the summer of 2018, once you've got a world strap around your shoulder. Yeah, it did. It changed completely because I was I was sitting in a box room in Boston belongs to uh, my, my previous promoters and I was getting promised this fight, that fight. Uh, my, my son had been born in May. I'll just give you this story. Mm. My son being born in May, um, I flew I flew to Boston in June because I was told I was going to be fighting in um, August So because I, I do my camps in Boston. So I uh, flew, out, flew out to Boston and that fight fell through. Then said, oh, October. November and then luckily enough the phone rang and I was in shape because of all these fights falling through 
that um, it was a world title eliminator. It was, it was initially against uh, Evgeny Gradovich, which everybody knows was a very, very tough fight. And I was going to Russia to take him on. And it, then he had some eyesight problems I had, and I had to fall through. So I had probably the worst six months of my of my career. Had my suitcase packed. I was packing it in. Honestly, I was going back to Australia. I was like, right, I've had enough. I've been six months away from my newborn son. I haven't spent any time with him and I've nothing to show for it. Not even, I haven't even got enough money to buy uh, Christmas presents for my two children, uh, which is Nicole and Theo. But um, I went to a De Bruin, a De Bruins, um, um, Boston Bruins game and um, I got a phone call. You're after, you're after getting a fight in Thailand for the eliminator. I couldn't believe it. It was like, it was like Christmas, Christmas came early. A week later, I was on the plane off to Thailand and fought this guy, uh, Tawachai, in an empty hall in Thailand. It was probably about, I'd say, the guts of 40 people. And the best part of those were officials. Yeah. <laughs> that, and um, But I got a bit, I scraped the win. Um, I think, like, I won the fight clearly, but I was fighting in his hometown, and you've got to be skeptical of corruption and stuff. The Philippine judge gave it against me, and luckily enough, I'm, I'm blessed. I still thank um, my, lucky, my lucky stars today that the Thai judge was not a corrupt judge because he could have very easily done the same thing and, and gave gave it uh, to the Thai guy by a close decision. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I won in a majority. And from there, then I won the world title. And um, that's when the phone call started ringing. I was getting offers like from different promoters to fight different fighters. And there was there was two different pathways. There was one to go, um, I think, the Al Heyman route, or the other one was with Eddie Hearn. But the reason I, would, I chose the Eddie Hearn route was because of the... They, they dangled the card in front of me becoming a unified champion and I really felt like I had the beans at Danny Roman and as you've seen the fight it was nip and tuck yeah. I know I took, a, I took a lot of punishment in some stages of the fight but they could have went either way if they, if those knockdowns weren't there so um, yeah but that's what I chased I chased the unification and um, I came up short so I'm just trying to get back into that position now ASAP the thing about the Danny Roman fight as well is that it's one of those occasions where I think, first of all, it was one of the fights of the year of 2019, but both boxers come out with their reputation in hands. Like, even in defeat, people probably saw what you can do in that loss. Yeah, so um, a lot of people have been saying that to me, like, you know, TJ, you're nobody even, because even as a world champion, I mean, and I knew this because I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pretty quiet, you know, I've... Um, I kind of get a little bit anxious before uh, interviews and I've cancelled more interviews than you can think of and <laughs> that's how my name has never really been out there because I just um, for lack of a better word I kind of, kind of shit myself when it comes to yeah, interviews because yeah. like, I'd be like what am I going to say but I'm getting used to them now you know but um, at the time and that's why I was relatively relatively unknown as a world champion but that's why everyone was saying you know, look TJ we know you lost and you look, you're going to have to take that boy. You say your stock has gone through the roof. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody loves you as a fighter now. And it was crazy. Like in, when I'm in America and when I'm at the boxing shows, like the the amount of Mexican fans coming up and showing me the respect and wanting to get photographs and autographs and everything because they love that style of fighting, you know. And they know they have it have it in me. Even even, even though I think uh, initially I, I I wanted a box Roman, but he kind of dragged me into a dog fight. And um, but at least I showed that. I have that in me now as well, you know. So um, I've got two two sides in my game. Absolutely, it was it was a proper war. Um, it's interesting you talk about obviously Tokyo and following on from Wayne McCullough, and that's like a magnificent achievement in and of itself. Um, it, beat Nawasa in his home turf. Does that add to the achievement as well? The fact you went to Japan to beat him. Uh, I think I think it does, and especially it, it kind of it's a, a bit of a to shut people up as well because people are saying it's a, it was a controversial decision it was a unanimous decision for starters so I don't know how it was controversial I'm fighting on a way soil you could see if you if people like anybody that does question it, have a look back at the end of the fight look at Iwasa's body language and look at my body language and like a few even like uh, renowned boxing experts were even saying it was the wrong decision like you know but uh if you look, if you look, watch the fight back. My coach was. I even asked my coach. I said, "What do you think?" Because I, I knew it was close. He was like, "You got this, eight four, eight four. My coach is the most relaxed man in the world. He was one bit panicky about it, but um, I think it adds a lot to it that I went away on away soil. I had nothing was given to me. Everything was earned. I went to I went to Thailand. I won the eliminator, and then I went to Japan, and I beat Iwasa 
in in a stadium where he'd won, I think twenty four or twenty some set twenty two of his twenty four fights. Um, he he'd won throughout his career, so he was comfortable. He was in his in his little nest, and I went there and I took his belt off him. So nobody can take that away from me, you know. And um, it's one thing I'm a world champion for the rest of my life now, you know. I'd imagine it makes the journey all that bit sweeter as well, given as you said, eighteen months beforehand. Fights are getting pulled. You're genuinely thinking about going doing something different, and then there mm-hmm. you are, up on the shoulders with the very unusual trophy they gave you alongside the belt in uh, Tokyo <laughs> as well. Yeah, I remember one uh, one of the boys, Kevin Byrne, another journalist, that he was saying, oh, "Congratulations to TJ for winning a karate tournament and the world title." <laughs> I don't I actually don't even know where that trophy is. I think it's in my uh, fiance's parents' house, but. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was a surreal moment. They gave me a little certificate as well. It's just the way they do it in Japan, you know. And it kind of took the shine off, you know, when you win a world title because, you know, you're there with the belt. But I had a certificate in one hand and I had a trophy in the other hand. It was kind of blocking the belt. But look, the main thing is um, I've engraved my name in history and I'm, I'm a world champion and it can never be taken away, you know. You box, as I mentioned, in all sorts of unusual places across the States, across Australia, Southeast Asia, uh, into you know Tokyo as well, now Dubai not too recently as well. I- I'm sure at some point, and there's lots of Irish boxers who say the same, you would probably love to box in Ireland at some stage. Yeah, it's a, it's a, dream, it's a dream for all of us, and especially a fighter of, of my calibre. Like I'm a world class, I'm a world class fighter now. Um, I'd like to think I would be a bit of a draw in my hometown, but um, you know, just the complications that's going on back home with everything um, with, with, with boxing and the Republic. Um, we're not getting we're not getting much luck with getting shows on. So at the moment, I just have to be the the portly globe trotter and travel the world and um, just take on the fights wherever they are, you know. But I'm, I, in in another sense, I'm really really enjoying the amount of cities I'm after fighting, and it's unbelievable. Every every fight's another city, another big city. I've been I fought like well, I fought Roman in the Forum. I fought in uh, the Ganis Arena in. Um, in uh, in Boston, you know, I fought in. Jesus, uh, I can go on. I'm, I'm, I'm Madison Square Garden. No, because I'm in Madison Square. Madison, that's another another dream come true. Madison yeah. Square Garden, you know, meeting all these high profile names, you know. So um, it's just unbelievable. It's a great journey, and just anybody that's following me or, or who's uh, who wants to know like how I'm feeling that since since my loss in Dubai, my career is far from over, yeah. and um, there's plenty more there's plenty more cities to fight in, and um, I won't be long before we're back on top. I'm, I'm hoping this uh, COVID-19 blows over as soon as possible and we can get something big to put me back in position by the end of the year. I know Omar Park is, is the dream overall. Uh, did, did you play Gaelic football for Port Leash in Omar Park? I assume you did. I, 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 pl- I, played, uh, un- I played underage hurling. Nice. And uh, I, was a, I was a nippy little... I won't, I won't be uh, shy to say it. I was a nippy little hurler. I was a little right corner forward. <laughs> I'd be whacking in the points there, no problem. And you can only picture like the size of me. I think I was when I was. Um, I remember when I was boxing when I was thirteen. I think I was thirty-three kilos. So you can only picture the side of me running around the pitch when Harlan Harlan was probably bigger than me. But um, yeah, no, I, di- I didn't really play Gaelic. But yeah, we used to play play um, small before the schools then as well, you know. But um, I, I was into everything: golf, soccer. You know, I was, I was quite good at every sport I played. But then um, just then um, when I when I started boxing, when I hit fifteen, sixteen. Boxing is the kind of sport where you can't be mixing it up. You just got to yeah. pick one. And I picked boxing and things took off once I started taking it serious. I started winning all Ireland championships and traveling the world with the, with the amateur team and honing the skills that has me in the position I'm in today, I suppose. Well, look, given you're in a Gaelic football town, how do you end up playing Hurling as your first love then? I know, look, Port Leash won a Hurling title when you were, what, I suppose kind of going into your early teens probably. Um, but what attracted you to Hurling? Uh, I don't know. I just I picked up a hurl, and um, I remember even as a kid, people were amazed at the size of me running around with a hurl. And I just, just I just just loved having the whack of a ball, and uh, hurling just was just a more of an interest to me. I think, um, and then once when I heard that there was hurling training up in the GA grounds, so then I think I was started at under tens, I finished up then under sixteen or something like that. But um, yeah, that that was just was just I think hurling was just more interesting to me at the time because I played soccer. Yeah. So I had soccer and I had hurling, so that was probably my ball game was soccer, you know. Mm. 
Well, look, TJ, it's been great to talk to you um, this afternoon, your time, the, this morning, our time. Uh, fingers crossed, as you say, COVID-19 will pass over as the summer goes on and you can get back out for some more interesting fights. And uh, it's been lovely to talk to you today. Yeah, and it's been fantastic talking to you too. Thanks very much for um, giving, me the, giving me the time and uh, giving me a chance to tell my story too. I really appreciate it.